Thank you. So, so these are my disclosures. And for me, it all began here in Indore. So my father was an ENT surgeon who uh, spent a lot of time here. Some people who might be senior might know him. He was an ENT surgeon here. And um, maybe that's where the passion for patient care, the passion for bringing your patient along with a journey uh, came to me. I studied here in Indore in St. Paul's School. I studied in MGM Medical College. Uh, and some pictures when I was a little bit younger, having a little bit more fun in the medical college and in the, um, the MY hospital where I learned my trade, learned how to speak to people, learned how to to work. But it, when I came here to Indore, I was thinking, how do I link Indore with the work that I've done? And, and what is Indori Pana? What is kind of being from Indore? It's about having jugaad. It's about, ho jayega, kuch bhi. You know, you have your contacts, you can make things happen. Thoda sa Indori jane, gyan baatna, you know, telling people what to do. It's also an Indori trait. But then also when I come back here, 25 years after leaving Indore, I realize Indore has changed. Indore is almost unrecognizable. From the Indore, I left it as it's grown, it's much more modern, it's so much cleaner. And maybe the world of diabetes has also changed a little bit over the last 25 years. And so maybe that's how we can bring things together. But some things don't change. You know, the food you get in Chappan doesn't change, even though the, the look and feel of Chappan changes, it's much more modern, it's much, much better. So I was trying to think, how do you bring in Jugaad into what work we do? And so what is Jugaad? Jugaad is kind of thinking, thinking outside the box. And what does research do? Research for, forces you to think outside the box. There is some standard protocol that you've been taught by your teachers, by people who've gone before. But how can you think differently? How do you come up with a research idea that asks a question that is different, and then you answer that question? It's trying new things. It's being open-minded. But there's also a thing that you have to curtail yourself. If you're doing a research study, you're following a protocol, you can't do jugaad and run outside the box. You have to follow the protocol to the word. Right, to get the same result. So maybe it's about knowing when not to use Jugaad and when to follow the, follow the rules. And how do you work Ho Jayega? And that is how you get to where you get to. You know, there was no major plan to be an academic to do research. I spend about 60% of my time doing research and 40% of my time seeing clinical patients. But this all came because someone said, do you want to do research? Oh, Ho Jayega. Let's try it and see what happens. I had no uh, knowledge, no prior experience, and you can just kind of use that Indori confidence that you can go somewhere and you can make things happen, find ways to make things happen. And it's always about knowing someone. In Indori, you always know someone who knows someone who can make something happen. And maybe I was lucky enough to work with people who knew how to do things. I could ask them for their support and make those things happen. So I just wanted to share what is the Indori touch or what are the things that I've managed to do in the world of diabetes technology. And if I started off with the kind of clinical care and research, I was trying to, uh, let's see if this works, I was trying to pull it together. It's like when you go to Chappan Dukan, there are 56 shops full of different types of food and products. And maybe as a diabetologist, there is so much choice as well about what drugs to use and what technology to use. And I've managed to do some work, some research involved with pumps, involved in uh, flash glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring, sensor augmented pumps in closed loops and in transplantation. I maybe tasted something and added something to each of the different shops in our diabetes technology world. When I landed in the UK about 25 years ago, um, one of the ways, to, if you wanted to train, do a, a MD uh, specialist work in diabetes, you had to do some research. And so the boss said, do you want to do some research? And I said, yes, that's what I always plan to do. That's my, you know, I'm really passionate about research. And I got this project which is one of the first large-scale studies using CGM. And you've heard Bansi Sabu talk about CGM today. This was 20 years ago. We were, had one of the biggest studies of CGM. And we, it was done by the Department of Transport that our truck drivers on insulin safe to drive trucks. So we had to follow people on insulin type 2 diabetes for a year and see, compared to sulfonylurea, if you put them on insulin, is the risk of hyperglycemia more or less? And what we found in the data there, that actually within... Eight years of starting insulin, the risk of hypoglycemia between sulfonylurea treated patients and insulin treated patients was the same. We asked them to feed in their report cards every week they had to report any hypos, but it's also the first study to use CGM for this purpose. And the data on the left there show the CGM rates were the same in the first column in the SU treated patients and the second column the insulin ones. But the, on the right, the type ones showed five times higher risk of hypoglycemia. Now again, here there was Jugaad. You had a low sensor glucose, and we didn't know how to define hyperglycemia on sensor. Is it a single reading down below 70 milligrams, or is it two or four? So we made up a diagnosis. 
we made up a definition of hypoglycemia that you have to be below your threshold for 20 minutes. And that's the same definition that's being used today, 25 years down the line. I then moved to King's and we set up a big pump service. And so, you know, how do you deal with a pump service of 900 patients? How do you prove the benefit? So one of the early stages of research is just doing audit, auditing your process. So we audited our data out to eight years of pump therapy. And hopefully you can see on the top line that patients starting pump therapy had an A1C of 9.5%. And they dropped down to about 8.4% on pump therapy. The red line is people who we started pumps because they were having hypos. And this was the first study to show over eight years that pump therapy was reducing weekly biochemical hypoglycemia. There were other studies showing the reduction of severe hypoglycemia. We showed a threefold reduction in severe hypoglycemia as well. But we showed you can reduce hypoglycemia without raising the A1C. You'll see that red line is stable. It's not increased. It's 7.5% and it's not going up. And then about 2004, 2005, the first sensor augmented pumps were launched. And being in one of the biggest pump centers in the UK, I was able to connect up with the Medtronic, get them to do some, uh, give us some sensors. And the first 35 patients we started, you can see on the left there, they had an average of five severe hypos per year, needing third party assistance, needing glucagon. We put them on sensor augmented pump that stopped insulin when the glucose goes low. And we showed a reduction down to zero in the rate of severe hypoglycemia. In fact, this 35 patient study is one of my most quoted papers because it was the first study to show in clinical practice a reduction of severe hypoglycemia with sensor augmented pump therapy. We then, working with companies, you have the access to their big data. So we looked at about 6,000 people across Europe. And, and we showed that using those people, the time in hypoglycemia, the orange bar there is the time in hypoglycemia without sensor. And then the green bar is with the Medtronic VO system and the third part, part with the 640G with the next generation. And with each generation of pump, we can see we're reducing the amount of hypoglycemia patients are having. The next step then was to do a large randomized controlled trial in people with impaired awareness. This is how we moved in, our, in my research journey, moved from doing um, observational studies to audit studies to large international randomized trials. This was a 150 patient randomized trial where, where we took people, everybody had impaired awareness of hypo or they had at least one severe hypo in the last year. And using that, we showed that the A1C stayed the same. But if you look at the fourth part, the time in hyperglycemia was reduced by 80%, and the number of severe hypos were reduced by 87%. In fact, the high-risk patients with impaired awareness, we got their severe hypo rate below the baseline level seen in people with normal awareness of hyperglycemia, showing the value of this. And on the back of these data, this was funded across Europe. So again, when you're doing research, you want to do the stuff that has an impact on clinical care. So the first study allowed truck drivers to drive in Europe because that changed EU law and allowed the law to say that if you're instant treated, you can drive lorries. This research again changed the practice. It allowed CGM to be funded in the UK. In the UK, then Libre, flash monitoring became funded on the, by the government. And so I was involved in the ABCD, which is the Association of British Diabetologists National Audit. And this is 9,000 patients using Libre. And what you can see is compared to baseline in blue. In red, you can see the numbers for admission for hyperglycemia, admissions for DK, ambulance callouts, and severe hyperglycemia are all significantly reduced in real world evidence. And again, this helps the rollout of these technologies in the UK. As, uh, as Sunilji mentioned, I've got an interest in hyperglycemia. So we then looked at a subset of those patients who had impaired awareness. And again, this is the first study that we did to show that you can restore awareness of hyperglycemia by using uh, CGM in this way. So in the Libra order, you can see the proportion of people reporting impaired awareness dropped from 14% to 4% with the use of freestyle Libre with alarms. And then when lockdown hit in 2020, we were very interested in the impact of lockdown on glucose control. And so we worked and got data from 10,000 people using Libre, so the data is uploaded onto the Libre view. And we can see there that on the left, you can see actually we see that just with sensors alone, we have improved the patients achieving targets significantly, but we've not got everyone to target. There's still about only 10% of people are achieving that very tight target of an A1C of 6% or 48 millimoles per mole. About 20% are at 7% target, which is 53 or 7%, and about 30%, one in three, are 7.5% A1C in type 1. But you can see during lockdown, as soon as lockdown hit, everybody's time in range went up by 5%. 
We thought that might be because if they're at home, they're scanning their sensor more, looking at it more, but actually the scanning frequency stays the same. And on Libre in these 10,000 people, the average scanning frequency is 10 times per day. If you remember what Bansi showed this morning, people with, who we say to do finger pricks, my, even though you advise four to six finger pricks a day, they might be doing two or three a day. But with Libre, everybody you've got across the 10,000 people, the average is 10 times a day. And the more times you see your glucose, the better your glucose control is. And so finally, the, and then the next study I was involved in was with the closed loop. So I've done the flash glucose monitoring. We looked at the CGM, we looked at the sensor augmented pump. The next step in diabetes technology was closed loops. So I was involved in the design and uh, conduct of the study. We were one of the main sites for the study, which was the ADAPT study. And we took people on injections and Libre and then compared them to people on a uh, closed loop system. And on the closed loop, the A1C drop was 1.5%. So there's, there's actually, a, they, we took them from an A1C of 9% down to 7.3. There's no other therapy, I think, in type 1 diabetes that can get you this sort of control. And again, on the back of this, these data were submitted to NICE in the UK. And when I go back now, the main challenge is going to be that NICE guidance is changing. And in the UK, anyone over A1C of 8% will get access to CGM with closed loop. That will be about 50% of the type 1 people in the UK. That's about 250,000 people. So our next challenge there as, cha as chair of the DTN will be, how is this implemented? Because our capacity to start that many people is not there. So we now have to start prioritizing a bit like the vaccines are prioritized and see who's going to start these closed loop first, how we're going to build on it. We were also d directed a pilot of closed loops. Again, we took people with an A1C above 8.5%. Gave them the closed loop, and you can see there are one from 9.4% with closed loops. These people got down to 7.7%. And these data were very important. In the UK, it's centrally funded. So you have to prove cost effectiveness. It's not just an expensive therapy will be given, it has to be cost effective in the long term. And with these data, we showed the cost effectiveness of closed loop therapy was on a range where it's fundable within the UK. You can see here time in range rising from 30% up to 65%. The next bit that we did was how do you put all these different research studies together so that the clinicians can get a pathway of how to treat someone with problematic hyperglycemia. I don't know, somehow from the data it seems, if you look at the HAT study, people in India, uh, type 1s, because the monitoring is less, might have a, either they run really high or they have a high risk of severe hyperglycemia. If you've got someone with problematic hyperglycemia, I wrote this with a group of international experts. We wrote the first expert um, pathway for someone with problematic hyperglycemia. If you have a patient with impaired awareness or has severe hyperglycemia, the first step is a proper education program, carb counting and uh, dose adjustment. And with that education program, which is about 10 hours of education, you can get a 50% reduction in severe hyperglycemia risk. 50% of the people will restore the awareness and stop having hypos. But if they're still having hypos, the next level is adding CGM. That should be the next step because that's the most cost effective and has the biggest impact on hyperglycemia. If they're then still having hyperglycemia, so stepwise, you can then add in hybrid closed loop, which further reduces the risk of hyperglycemia. And then the final step is, is transplantation. So for 15 years, I ran the islet transplant program at King's College London. And we were part, of, I wrote the international guidance for how to manage people post islet and pancreas transplantation, how to assess the function of transplantation. So I was involved in writing those guidance and we published the results of our service where we showed that when you follow that pathway, so this was a student who did a study, who did the study in my team. We looked at the patients referred for islet transplantation and had multiple severe hypos. Of those patients, the first 50% of patients, we were able to stop having severe hyperglycemia with no deterioration in A1C just by giving them education and technology. There were some further patients who had come to us with a higher rate of severe hyperglycemia, where they were in the process, but actually the severe hypo rates had dropped from about 20 severe hypos a year down to one or two. And finally, those people who came to us with more than 50 severe hypos a year, who were, who couldn't, who were housebound because of the hyperglycemia, with transplantation, we could drop their hyperglycemia to zero and um, resolve them. So one of the other things that you can do, and you know, I said, as an Indori person, you know, you, you want to find policy, you want to make changes to how people think. So one of the other roles I do as the chair of Diabetes Technology Network is write the national guidance to advocacy and policy change. Because Diabetes Technology Network, we did the recommendation that helped access to flash glucose monitoring in the UK. We wrote the pathway that in type 2 diabetes, a lot of you will be familiar with 
monotherapy, you start metformin, dual therapy, you add your second drug, maybe DPP-4 or SU, triple therapy, you add SGLT-2 or GLP-1. So it's for type 1 diabetes, you can think of it in the same way. You've got your monotherapy or simple therapy, which is insulin with finger pricks. You can then add technology monotherapy, first line should be CGM, because that's the cheapest one. And then when you add CGM, if you're still not at target, you can add the dual therapy, which is CGM and pump as closed loop, and you get yourself to target. So that was a pathway that we wrote to help um, things move forward. And with these technologies now, we're, at least in the West, we're at a position where it's now the user's choice that they can either drive their glucose control themselves as a car, they can choose what tools to take, how to measure their glucose, or they can let the technology drive it. That's a picture of me in the Tesla. You can see the hands are off the steering wheel. The car drives itself. You can relax when you go. A closed loop is very similar. Just put it on, and there you are. The final piece of work that I've been doing a lot of is doing teaching and advocacy. So we built a website for Diabetes Technology Network. There's about a quarter of a million pounds worth of investment that we managed to get from industry partners with free to access education for doctors and for patients. And our focus was that if the doctors and patients are taught the same thing by the same language, then when they speak to each other, they are saying the same things. Because here, when you're trying to convince a patient to do something, everybody has their own tricks, their own way of convincing. And when the patient moves from one person to the other, they get confused that that doctor said that thing, that doctor said that thing. Same thing happens in the UK. And so we thought that if we have a similar training program for all the doctors that they run through, and this is all CPD accredited, and actually when you see a patient, you send the patient to the same website where they learn how to use the CGM, they learn how to use the pump the same way. Actually, we found a much better uptake of technology, much better retention of technology, and much better progress with that technology. And then when we start using technology, and it's probably the same in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, the most important thing is the person who you're giving that technology, that treatment to. And so one of the final things that I got involved with, certainly at King's, is a very strong mental health, psychology, psychiatry strength in our team. And we are realizing that although we are giving therapies in type 2 diabetes, you're giving better and better drugs in type 1 diabetes, you're giving better and better technology. The main problem, the main challenge is the person taking those medications and their thought process. And how do you build it? So we built a patient-focused consultation tool, which, which was rolled out. And now this is being used in Australia in clinics who've come and visited us. They've rolled it out across in Spain, Italy, Switzerland, and in the UK. There's many centers using this tool that I've developed where we use this in the waiting area, and many of you might be using it as well. What are your main questions? What are the main problems you've got? And it diverts our consultation towards the problem the patient's having. And we screen for hypo-unawareness, we screen for A1C, we screen for diabetes distress as a routine in our clinical care. And when you're using a tool that collects all these data, that enables you to target the right person. So I was talking a bit about Jugard. Again, when you're involved with these companies, we managed to get 6,500 sensors from the companies. Uh, during COVID, so that the patients on the ward needing insulin therapy would not have to have finger pricks. The nurses wouldn't have to be stressed. They could kind of do it uh, in a touchless way. Finally, I'm going to talk about change. And, you know, standard of care in many countries are still multiple daily injections with finger pricks. But this is really now moving ahead. And I think in India, slowly things are moving as well. Standard of care for type 1 diabetes or instant treated diabetes now is CGM with injections. And maybe then if you're not at care, it's CGM with, with uh, pump therapy or with a closed loop. And maybe in the future, we'll move towards dual hormone closed loops as well. But what's really changing care and the way we do our care is the data-driven consultations. Because previously, you know, we speak to the patient, they might have done a few readings here and there. But now when we see someone, we've got that 24-hour profile on the CGM. When we log in, we know what insulin they've taken. We've got connected pens and pumps. So we know which insulin they took and which insulin they missed. We know when they were supposed to take 10 units, they only took 4 units. So now we're actually dealing with truth. There is no other branch of medicine. You don't adjust blood pressure without measuring the blood pressure. You don't adjust cholesterol therapy without measuring cholesterol. But so how can we adjust insulin without knowing what the complete glucose profile is? And then there's some other work that we've been doing. How do we integrate uh, patient care? So here's a, a study I did using a robot to work with pediatric patients where to deal with that anxiety, that tension between the parent and the child. Use the robot as a middleman. How is the glucose going? The robot accesses the glucose data and then gives the patient a comment on the glucose is good or bad and takes away that tension between the parent and the patient. And with data, we've done some lot of work now with risk stratification as well. That if you have data on instant therapy, on blood pressure, on glucose through connected devices, then this theory of seeing everyone every three months doesn't make any sense. 
right? What you want to do is you want to risk stratify patients. So we wrote a post COVID, we wrote a risk stratification protocol. How do you categorize your patients into red, amber, green? The patients who are red, you want to see frequently, maybe every month until you get them into the green zone. Patients who are green, you can see back in a year. Why do we clog up our system with seeing the patients who are doing really well? You want to spend your time on patients not doing really well. So post COVID, we implemented this and across our system, we've got ways of doing this as well. But the challenges certainly in the US are in the UK around where the data sits because we have data, patient data that's sitting with the patient. We have industry data sitting on the CGM. We have hospital data sitting in the hospital care and we have primary care data sitting in primary care. And we have to find a way to integrate those data systems. So that's where a lot of the work now, some of the projects I'm working on are based on how to integrate these data systems and provide uh, a rapid and timely response by prioritizing the patients who need your support the most. And finally, we have to work on how do we, you know, in the UK, certainly we want to minimize our input and how do we use remote care? So the patient doesn't have to travel to see me, I can access someone wherever they are. We develop protocols for remote onboarding, for pump therapy, for CGM. And we've just shown some data. I've just got it published uh, yesterday, saying that remote starts of CGM with no education had the same benefit as a face-to-face -face start giving four hours of education. So that means that we can remove this need for sitting down with a patient and educate about CGM. They can watch an online video and off they go. So finally, I want to say kind of 25 years from where it all started, it's been a long way. Um, in those 25 years, there's been a lot of research, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, there's lots of future work. We were involved in a study where you can just put your finger in a machine and it will give your A1C. So no need for a test that costs six rupees. You invest in the machine and you can do thousands of screens together. We want to come back to India and work with people, you know, thanks to my first initial contact with Bansi um, 10 years ago at the ATTD. Now I've been integrated with the RSSTI and Diabetes India and all this work. Um, trying to get involved with patient advocacy groups. Jazz Sethi does a lot of work with diabetes. I was in uh, Ramakrishna Mission Hospital in Haridwar uh, four days ago, um, just looking at where a lot of work is happening with type 1 diabetes um, across the country. That's what I want to hopefully be able to support and give back and avoid these sort of pictures. Diabetes, but just a bhedbao, diabetic care, that patient is not allowed to travel somewhere, trying to deal with that um, stigma that happens. So, yeah. Thank you for your attention. And while you're in Indore, I hope you, involve, you, you take advantage of the sale and the snacks that are out here. Thank you.